Hey, back, hey, to, five. back to five. I want to do the dramatic soap opera take of like, what? Don't do it, Steve. <laughs> Remember Oscar <laughs> Golden used to do that, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't exactly. do it, Steve. Oh, that's it's right. Always, it's always the kind of like, uh, you know, kind of like, I've got some terrible news. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit Clark Kent, Todd. I like it. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I bought yeah. these. I bought new new glasses, and they're like actually made by Iron Man. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think that Tony Stark from the comic books, but I think it's <laughs> it's meant for dudes who are huge because they're actually like large on me. Look how big they are. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Usually, like I get glasses, and they're like, looks like so I got you, them. You out walked of, like, in to the optometrist, and he said, "I need glasses for a dude that's huge." <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I say that in every store I walk into. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah and, not, and he's probably like, once you put the glasses on, you'll see for yourself. It's not that huge. It's not, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you clearly, you clearly need glasses, is what he says. Yeah. How are you guys Anyways. good? Good Shane, man. Good. Shane's yeah. here. Yeah, Mr. Shane. Yeah. Dude, it has been such a drag carrying this fucking thing without you. <laughs> <laughs> you guys carry it up? Yeah, it's been fun. We've had uh, quite a few cool people, so yeah. But it's going to be even more fun today now that you're here. Oh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I, I say it. When you're not here, you're just like the total, like, you know, yeah, I just start whipping boy. You're like, whatever. He's not here. Like, But as soon as you're here, it's like, oh, Shane's here, my best friend. And then as soon as he's gone, what a jackass. Screw that guy. <laughs> it's good to be back it is yes it's good so, to have you. Uh, yeah it is it's it's awesome and i'm sure we can all uh agree today is going to be great because we've got a uh, legendary guest on today so uh yes. we shouldn't waste any time because we want to use the pretty much all the time we have because i'm sure there's so many stories so um well, people, let's should we, people should know that we, re we, we recorded a song he wrote a little while ago the most attention we get now is because of his song <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't he get enough attention from that song? I mean, now we <laughs> we recorded a version of it of uh, "When I'm With You" by his old band Sheriff, and everybody just fell in love with it. And uh, every story that I, everybody's had a story about, like I love that song, and I I at my prom and at my, my high school dance, we got married to that song. I'm like, oh wow, okay, cool. You know, I didn't realize. It. I'm like, well, that's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. So, you know, yeah, let's I'm do pretty this. sure. I'm pretty sure this guy is responsible for probably 80 percent of the wedding dances in you know in canada or all over the world so well i'm sure we'll get to all those but uh yeah. we should bring him on and uh, you know get his take on it so Corey, Corey. i'll give you with the introduction today sure so our guest today i'm so excited about from one of my favorite canadian bands two of my favorite canadian bands frozen ghost and sheriff right. he's played with three of our past to talk people that's right freddie kirchy that's right phil x that's right and Derry gran i didn't know that didn't know oh. that i didn't know that either until today from honeymoon suite exactly yep. okay um he wrote when i'm with you like you just said our mm -hmm. current single mm -hmm. and was a member of sheriff went on after sheriff broke up to to uh front frozen ghost with the bass player from Sheriff, Wolf Hassel. Then after that broke up in the night in the nineties, then he went on to produce, become a huge big time producer. Our Lady Peace, Finger Eleven, King's X, Simple Plan, Thousand Foot Crutch. And he's the Juno Award winner. It's gonna be an awesome show today. Please welcome to the show, Arnold Lanny. <laughs> Hey Arnold! Hi Arnold! Uh, <laughs> Hello. Hi, Hello. That's, that's great. I would uh, I would pay admission just to hear you guys banter. Just, just, <laughs> just you guys, you're doing your thing. It gets old really quick. It's like it's too yeah. bad you had to bring me on. It's like <laughs> now your show's just gonna just go down. <laughs> down Never. Off. Not at all. No Not at all. Trust me. It's it's it's, it's kind of like when you uh, when the when the Beatles brought in Billy Preston because they didn't get along anymore. That's what's happening here. That's what's happening. <laughs> Good one, Todd. Uh, so it's so cool well, to have you, you on the uh, show. You you're in L.A., aren't uh, you? You live here now, do you? Yep. I uh, I live just out. I couldn't see myself living in Los Angeles. I when we moved here about 15 years ago or so. I had uh, well, I still have four children, but they're, they're grown up now, but they were younger. And um, 
we just didn't want to live inside of Los Angeles. I want to have access to it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of I, uh, the artists that I work with, as long as I was near an airport, so we decided to to a place called Temecula, which when you first hear it, it sounds like you're suffering from curable disease. You know, it's like, <laughs> I have Temecula. It's like, oh. You know. But uh, in, in, in fact, it's just a beautiful little town, uh, just a lot of vineyards and orchards. And you know what? We, we drove here and thought, uh, we went up and down Highway 5, starting in Calabasas, went all the way to San Diego, came back up the other side, found this place and said, this is where we're going to live. And so mm. we've cool. been here ever since. So it's about 75 miles southeast of Los Angeles. The climate is a, it's considered a desert climate. And uh, so, you know, we don't get any rain. Like, I mean, we get less rain than Los Angeles. So mm. it's crazy. Okay. That's okay. Hey, um, thank you for having I, me on, though, guys. I'm no really, problem. And no. and I, I, I got to tell you, I'm... I was so honored and flattered that you guys wanted to uh, record that song. And when I heard, it's funny because I guess after it was done, because I didn't know you were you were you were doing it until my phone started to blow up. And hey, <laughs> you know, check this out. I got a bunch of links sent to me, and I said, <laughs> "Fuck, these guys sound awesome. Who are they?" <laughs> you know, so you, you did a great, great job. Um, you know, and uh, for me, that song has, I mean, songs uh, are are sort of like children. You know, it's like they all have their own personality. Uh, they uh, sometimes don't reach the success you want them to have, you know, but <laughs> you love them nonetheless. You know what I mean? Um, but that song was really never intended to be a song that I wanted to record myself, let alone to have other people record. I literally wrote that for my girlfriend, who's now my, you know, been my wife for like since the Mesozoic era. And so basically- <laughs> Since the Zemeckia you know, like era. It, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, it was literally about 40 years ago. And, um, you know, being a broke musician, it was Valentine's Day. I didn't have any money, but like, so that's a shocker, right? A young musician <laughs> with no money. Never heard of that before. But, uh, you know, I wanted, obviously, I want to do something nice for her, but I couldn't afford to, to get her something special, let's say, like at a store. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll just write her a song and um, then I'll sing it into a set recorder. So I, literally went downstairs uh living at my mom's place at this point again shocker musician <laughs> <laughs> um but uh, i just you know put my copy down and song came out and i said okay well what should i say well i guess i'm going to talk about how i feel when she's around and that doesn't sound right so i thought yeah, when I'm with you, I feel this and I feel that. And I say, oh, yeah, let's do that. And honestly, God, maybe five, ten minutes later, I sang it into the recorder. And my plan was to play it for that. I used to go to donut shops. Like that was the highlight of our dating life. <laughs> you know, like in those days, they had these games called Pac Man and stuff. Like these, sure. like you go to a donut shop, you. Like you steal like 11 quarts out of your mother's coat. And you basically, I'd say at a donut shop, we share a French crawler and a, a couple of coffees. Being Canadian, you know, like, but I went very to Canadian. style or Tim yeah. Hortons, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but anyway, we, my time was, uh, I was going to see her that night and uh, I'll pick her up. But before we go into the donut shop, I'll play it, I'll put it in the, in, in the van player. Um, which for those people who are way too young don't know what that is it's an old tape device <laughs> it's, i actually met people that don't know what a cassette player is like, yeah i know yeah. yeah it's like fuck am i old jesus <laughs> <laughs> you know? um but at, at any rate uh, I, I put it in and i said um i i wanted to give you this for valentine of course you know my recollection is you know, of course, starts crying and 
that was awesome because you know what's coming next you know it's like she's happy right, right? It's like, good thing you, good thing you <laughs> had the van right yeah <laughs> right i mean uh there's always a, a motivation we're guys right but yeah. Yeah. at any rate um you know she had, I, I i played for her she loved it and i thought of it again until we're getting i say about a year or so went by really we're in the studio and yeah uh and then the producer at the time who did the first sheriff record we were literally packing up our stuff getting ready to go to hamilton we, re we recorded at a place called Grand avenue which was owned by danny lenoir who was literally producing u2 at the time but, uh wow. we were at his studio but we were before that we were rehearsing in an eight track studio uh, again, it's hard to imagine today that there would even be a studio that had an A-track when you could literally have a laptop in your house today with, with 512 tracks, you know? Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. it, it is what it is. So at any rate, we're really packing up, and the producer says, so there's no other material, right? And I said, being leader of the band, I said, no, that's, that's pretty well it. He said, okay. And then one of the guys in the band said, how about that song your girlfriend always talks about? Like, how, you know, like, what's that? No, 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 no. That's not a real song. <laughs> I said, no, well, so now the producer, of course, and of course me, that's what I've been doing the last 30 years is production. It's like, well, let me hear it. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, because we often attach feelings to songs that, and that's what gets songwriters we're also artists in trouble sometimes because they attach a feeling to it that only they are experiencing good or bad right the idea so that make sure that the listener experiences the same feeling you are but at any rate i said no no that's all of it and he said well what song are they talking about and i i said it's, it's nothing it's a it's a nice song <laughs> it's just a song i wrote for my girlfriend well then let me play it now, of course my roads is all up at this point a giant Hammond C3, like, I mean, in those days stuff, you just put it under your arms. Like, this is like big shit. <laughs> yeah. So he, he, he literally, said, no, I, I, I'm not leaving until you play it. So I, I, I said, all right, but you have to promise me we're not going to record it. So I remember playing it for him. And he says, oh, no, no, we're recording that. <laughs> and, I, and I fought him, fought him, and fought him. Which is, and I'll tie this into something else later. Um, and I said, no, no, no. But sure enough, we go, we, we go to the studio. We're, we're starting to track. And then he says, okay, now we're going to record that girlfriend song you have. And I said, <laughs> no, that's, that's, no, that's, it's like, no, no, you record that. But, so finally I relented because at this point, the production company had heard it and said, no, we have to record that. And I said, okay, I'm only going to record it if you promise it's not going to be single. If you don't wow. release it, it's just going to stay in the album. In those days, you could do that because you'd yeah. earmark certain songs as being singles and the rest were AOR tracks or album-oriented yeah. tracks that just your fans got to hear. And of course, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. And me, like an idiot, believed them. <laughs> so um, we record the song and the whole record I mean, it didn't take longer than a few weeks. We did the the basics in maybe two or three weeks and then went into these local joints and would do a, a background here, some guitar overdubs here and so on and so forth. But I, you know, I mean, the song, the way I, I remember it is we went in, played it once through, uh, the guy hits the top back and says, hey, how's that? Bass player said, "Okay, I, I missed something in the fourth bar. Okay, I, I missed harmony here. Blah blah blah. Okay, we'll do a second pass, and we punched on on the fly. Within about three takes, like the major part of the song was done. So mm. jump ahead now, and um, the album gets released, and it's doing okay. But right in the middle of it, as uh, and this isn't the only time it's happened to a lot of musicians." We were signed to Los Angeles, which for Canadian men was a big deal. So EMI in LA just got rid of the guy who signed us. So in now comes the new president, 
And of course now it's lose lose because it keeps us and we're successful. The shareholders go, why did we hear the guy that signed these guys? Right? Mm -hmm. He keeps us and we stiff. He says, that's why we hired you to get rid of the idiots that this guy signed. So <laughs> within a matter of weeks of him, right? So we knew we were going to get dropped. So at mm -hmm. any rate, the song comes out literally as we're getting dropped. So on one hand, there's like a, a whole dinner album, which in those days meant it was discontinued. Okay. Like it's, if you ever see an album with a, a hole in the corner, in those yeah. big 12 inches, yeah, um, it, it means that they, they're out of pocket and you're not supposed to pay full pot for them. Wow. So at any rate, um, but this song, when I'm with you, again, it was released twice. So the first time it was released, when I'm talking about, I want to say 1982, 1983, around there. No, about 82, around, around there, early 82, I want to say. Um, Anyway, everywhere they played it, it went to number one. The problem, though, the record company wasn't pushing it. So it number one in Detroit, but in Chicago, they'd never heard of it. Like it's right. a three-hour drive, but, but then in Pittsburgh, it was number one. But in Cleveland, they hadn't heard of it. So hmm. Hmm. Um, the song went... To number one in so many major markets, but basically with no support, it fizzled out, it died, the band split up. So seven years go by now, right? Out of principle, I go back uh, at, during this time, the band splits up, I start Frozen Ghost. Um, I, I wanted to, I remember signing away the publishing to the song. I, and I always felt bad about it because I thought, this is dumb. Like, why do they deserve it? Like, I, I don't understand. I, I can even understand sharing it. But, like, long story short, um, we approached the production company, and they had fell on, fallen on hard times. So we bought publishing back. Oh, cool. Two years go by. <clears throat> yeah. Now, when I bought that publishing back, everybody on my team said I was an idiot. Really? Because you, yeah, because the, the album's deleted, right? This is during the video era, so there was no video to it. Like mm -hmm. MTV was huge. It's like it's a it's one of those old hair bands. No one gives a shit, right? <laughs> but I said I I give a shit. I wrote yeah. that for my what? It's like I'll be fucking damned if I, I'm gonna. I don't care if it never makes a penny. I'm gonna own it. So, and you know, my, everybody, my accountant, my lawyer all said, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't, but I took the advance I made from Frozen Ghost and went to buy that because I made Frozen Ghost in my house. So I was able to save some money there. But I did it, a, this is before me and all that stuff. But anyway, that's the story. But two years go by and I'm sitting and you and you guys will appreciate this because being Canadian, I'm, I'm sitting in... Uh, Nora, Ontario. Okay, it's the middle of, I want to say January, yeah, probably January, the end of January. And in those days, because we didn't have a cell phone, uh, we had to stop at every city, get on a phone booth, and phone our manager, who was my brother at the time, to find out what you know what times are loaded in, blah blah blah, to get all our sort of. You know what it's like when you're on the road, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. what hotel are we yeah. in? All this kind I don't of know stuff. How we did it, we, thinking back now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was insane. Like, yeah. I mean, I, and I knew. So, anyways, I so I went up. I said uh, to Kev, uh, our, our driver, I said, Kev, at the next like pull over in Kenora, I got I got to phone the office before it gets late. So I called the office, and all I hear is screaming in the back. And I'm going, what, what, what's going on? My brother is like, you're not going to fucking believe this. We have a hit. And I'm thinking, how is that possible? Because Frozen Ghost, the, we had just done a song two months earlier, and we were chasing that up and down. And it's like, I haven't heard anything. No, no, it's the other song. 
I, what? Like, yeah, right. when I'm with you. When I'm with you, what are you talking about? Well, long story short, and I might get some of the the cities wrong, but I want to say it was Reno, Nevada. Back in those days, in the early 80s, radio was having a tough time with MTV because MTV wanted the world to know they brought us. And of course, with the radio industry and the history they had, you know, of breaking the Beatles and Elvis and Little Richard, all these, they said, no, we still have power. Right. So um, one day, uh, this is a story I was told by the people who were responsible for it, both the guy from Capitol and uh, the guy at, at Reno. I want to say it was Reno. It might have been Las Vegas, but it was one of those towns. Mm -hmm. um, the, the PD director, uh, the program director, is talking now to the guy at Capitol and having some you know chit chat, small talk. It's after work. What's going on? So, yeah, market this and that. It's like, fuck, man. Like we just need, we need something different. And he says, you know what? I, I'm going to send you something. And Brian Reno says, well, what do you go? Just let me send you something. Um. Okay. He goes, but do me a favor. When you get it, play it, and then wait. He says, yeah, but so, and a few days go by. He gets this 45, right? Plays it off a 45. <laughs> In those days, you didn't do it. Played it off a cartridge, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the phones go crazy. Now, again, in those days, you'd have what they call live action. It was if the phone was a turntable hit, it mean like it meant that nobody gave a shit. Like it climbed the charts, but nobody cared. When a song was live, it meant the phones were going crazy. Because kids would call up and say, Hey, play that sound that goes, ah! and that's <laughs> <laughs> judged. I, I'm not kidding. That's how they did it. So they played it. The phones were all lit up and they call and goes, Yeah, play the you know that song. And they'd sing the song. And he thought, this is insane. So he said, next hour, the, he says, We're gonna play. He tells this team, we're gonna play it again, guys. Plays it again, phones light up. Plays it the next hour again, phones light up. The next day, he calls the guy at Capitol and says, Okay, how did you do that? Like, like he goes, Don't tell me. You played the song and the phones lit up. He goes, yeah, how the fuck did you do that? He goes, no, no, no. He goes, years ago, that song, I, he goes, I was the program director in Detroit. And we used to have the top six at six. And that song, I couldn't beat it with a stick. He said, we literally had to lie just to get it off the fucking radio because <laughs> people kept requesting it every day <laughs> just to get rid of it because we had to say, oh, we have a winner. You know, it's like, lo and behold, it's, you know, Johnny and the Johnsons, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. just to get us off the radio. So he says, I'm telling you, he says, well, where is that now? He goes, oh, no, they, they, like, they're gone. Like, he says, so the whole band? He goes, nope. Is there a video? Nope. He said, ah, that's perfect. So he literally sends this song up to all the cities sister stations and you know every station is owned by a conglomerate right in those days it wasn't quite what it is now but you might have a company that owned you know three stations another one that owned 40 stations so this company happened to own quite a few stations you know like Tulsa the Seattle and anyway they sent the song they made a card and they sent it out with instructions play this song mm -hmm. so as they got mm -hmm. it no bio nothing Phones lit up. They're having their meetings. It's like, okay. Before the conversations could start, they said, "What's going on with the song? Who are these guys? Why are my phones so active? <laughs> how, how is this happening?" <clears throat> uh, let's just run with it. And so he calls the guy from Capitol. Says, "Hey, we're going to play this." No, no. He goes, "No, you can't. We 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 don't even own the band." It's just, you can't do that. It's it's deleted. But they're gone. 
it's like it's it's too late. Like it's already getting requests. By the time I got word, it was already top forty on the Hot 100 Billboard charts in America. So at this point now, everybody's trying to play catch up. Like they're trying to figure out, okay, find these guys, put them back together, put them on the road. And I'm saying, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do that. Like I'm flattered that the song. Anyway, as you know, with 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 Billboard, the writers and the band always know a week ahead of time. So on that phone call, I had heard next week you're gonna be on the top 40 on on the hot 100 with with a bullet. Wow. And I said, that's impossible. And my brother <laughs> said, no, I, we just got off the phone. So, and then the week after that, we're like, you know, 31 with a bullet. And of course, for people that don't know what the bullet meant, it was our, the trajectory was going up. Yeah. And so every, so, and I remember like it was yesterday, uh, I, I think we kicked Paula Abdul out of first position. The week I had, I got the call and we were in, you know, I don't know, bumfuck wisconsin or someplace i don't know but <laughs> anyway uh we got the call and said rob says congratulations it says next week your song is going to be number one song in the world wow and no video great. think of it no video nothing to recoup no no How crazy that? yeah right no record label no i, I, I mean it wasn't like we had Spotify today, where you can literally, you don't need a label. In those right. days, eight guys with bad suits <laughs> controlled your life. Yeah, yeah. Your music lives. You know, if they didn't like you, that's the way it was. But anyway, that song went on to have a life. It went to number one again, but this time it went prop across every major market. And of course, the fan mail, which was actually like literally Letters, paper yeah. in those days, Snail mail, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. So, um, that's why that song means a lot to me. It was written in the most pierced, uh, honest fashion because I never intended it for it to be a song, never, you know. I mean, no, um, but. It also taught me when I went on to do production that there's a lot of bands that you know they'll have a song goes yeah you don't really want to record that <laughs> it's like well yeah but it's a good song we're gonna we're, you know we're gonna record this and I gotta fight them you would not believe some of the discussions I've had fellas songs that have been number one songs around the world that I literally had to like promise them okay I'll buy you dinner for a month. <laughs> you just just trust me on this you know what i mean this and mm. you know it's the best thing they ever did but um that song and i've got a handful of others that really mean a lot but the way you guys did it that's what made it special is uh it, it brought back every feeling that i had when i wrote it so that's the mark to me of a good performance is when you feel that when 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 i can hear it 40 years later and go fuck they what a great job like oh, that, that's they awesome. really did a great job that means that's a lot. really great job that's just, awesome you, to hear we from just you. Used your, your blueprint that's all we did and you know it's a testament <laughs> to the song for sure i'm i'm curious well, to know do you still have that cassette demo yeah, yeah. thank you wife. <laughs> you know you, you know what's weird my my wife because it was valentine's just the other day and i like an idiot forgot uh, you know, <laughs> uh, so uh, but remember i wrote your song honey i did you know you know what guys and that can only get you maybe to the 35th year after that <laughs> <laughs> but uh no like my wife's awesome you know like uh we just started talking about it because uh, when the song number one the second time, uh, I had I had a cousin who commissioned an artist to make me something to commemorate. Um, it's the only award I keep on the wall. Like if you were to come into my studio, I don't, I'm not one of those guys that, you know, hangs up awards and shit. Like I remember being a kid going into 
the big studios and I'd see like, you know, Platinum Bruce Springsteen or, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, the Zeppelin records. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm so shit compared to that. Right. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I thought, and I thought to myself, if I'm ever, if I'm ever successful to any degree and I'm in the position to maybe help some, some young kid, I'm never in a facility where I have awards about me. It shouldn't be about me. Mm -hmm. And if it is going to be about me, it should be about how am I going to help you? Mm -hmm. You know, like on this particular record, how can I help you? And so, but that award, which isn't an award, it's, it's a work of art that someone who loved me made it for me. So I took a picture sent to my wife. Um, and, uh, and she asked, do you still love, literally after she said, do you still have the original cassette? It's like, oh gosh, that, that's buried someplace. I know I've got it someplace, but that's wow. cool. Like, that's that you 40 know you years have the music. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, like it's, it's someplace. Uh, but again, uh, what makes the song again, it, like I'm six, five. And so I've got four unbelievable kids that I, I love more than life itself. Um, that all started my four amazing kids which i i call the best co-production i ever did you know, <laughs> is, uh, the greatest tips you know, is, is basically um all came about because i was lucky enough to see this girl at some party and i never used to go to party because i don't drink or anything like that but they would beg me to go because i would be the the driver mm -hmm. and so we were at this party and i and I saw her and I said, oh, holy fuck, my God, she's <laughs> just ridiculously hot. Like, I, I couldn't <laughs> stop staring at her. I'm sure if she even, like, she didn't know I was alive. But if she saw me, she probably thought, what a creep. Like, this guy's creep. <laughs> I just couldn't stop staring. <laughs> like, to me, was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. Not just in that town, like, like ever in the right. movies in life like she was the hottest girl i ever saw in my life so <laughs> i i said well I'm, me like an idiot of, of course they can't go talk to her you know what's it, <laughs> what, it's like if you think i'm ugly now you should have seen me back then <laughs> at least i've got a few bucks that can make you maybe change your mind you know? back then like a you know like an ugly broke musician this, you know, like, like, what am I offering? You know, really. So, uh, at any rate, little did she know. Short, we, uh, yeah. Well, uh, and it wasn't until uh, another party. We were in the same town, and the guys dragged me out to this. And, and again, she, she was there because it was a small town, and uh, it was during it was over the Christmas holiday, so all the schools were let out. So that's why she was at both house parties. And when you're in the band, you get invited to house parties. Sure. So uh, I'm sitting in the kitchen, a giant farmhouse by myself. Everybody's listening to old Steve Miller records. They're just getting high and, you know, <laughs> having fun. And I'm sitting like an idiot in the kitchen, literally just sitting there like this. She walks <laughs> in, I guess, to get a glass of water. Or something. She looks around. She goes, are you waiting for somebody? I'm thinking, <laughs> she talking to me? Like, holy fuck. She actually know uh, I said, no, I'm just uh I'm just just waiting like for what? <laughs> so she sat down. She started talking to me. So I said, Thank you, God. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a religion. <laughs> it's like this is divine intervention. I don't know how this happened because I knew she was there, but like, why talk to her? Like, there's no way. But at any rate, um, we struck up a conversation. And because she was so out of my league, I thought, I'm, I'm not going to try to be, you know, clever or funny. Not that I could be anyway. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, so I just, we just talked. And she'd say, well, what do you do? It's like, well, I, I, I'm in a band. Oh, were you at the yeah? We at so and so. It's like, I guess I said something. 
that's the impression I must have left you. You don't even know I was in the band, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, but as time went on, she remembered me. And funny thing is, she said afterwards when we got serious, that was the moment she knew there was a connection. So I always tell my son because they're you know, really nice kids and they're, they're shy and it's like, you know, if I would have known then, what I know now as a grown man, that a girl just wants you to be yourself and just to yeah. be confident and, and secure with who you are. I was, but I didn't know, you know, I lost my dad early. It was, uh, again, how I learned how to play the piano. But so I didn't have anybody telling me, hey, this is what you got to do. You know, so mm -hmm. I, I didn't know. I saw a beautiful girl and thought, yeah, well, she, she won't like me. So I'm going to be a bit lower. <laughs> <You know>? But <laughs> it, like, so that song was honestly a real attempt to put into words what she meant to me. And right. I'm happy to say that we're still married after all this time. And that's I've great. Tried to Congrats. provide her with, yeah, <clears throat> well, like, uh, I mean, it's not, it's not like it's always easy. Like for anybody who's been married, you know, like, uh, it, it's a great thing, but like anything, you, uh, the times that are tough because you're raising children as well. And yeah, but, uh, anyway, it, it is what it is, but Arnold that's, that's what, why. What about I, your I, mother? I up for recording that song. Oh. What about your mom? Did she get to experience the celebrating it the first time and the second time oh. as a hit? Oh yeah, my mom is amazing. Like, God bless her. I mean, she she passed a couple of years ago, so she saw mm -hmm. she saw all she saw the worst of my career, like literally eating craft dinner and peanut butter sandwiches. Uh, yeah, because you said off camera earlier that. that. She, you said she was discouraging of you being a musician early on, right? Oh my gosh, she she cried and cried when I, like I said before we went on. Um, when I told her I was going to quit school to be a musician, uh, you, again, I, I I'm I'm not trying to be facetious here. You'd think I would have said, I want to be a murderer and rape women. <laughs> <laughs> and she probably she probably would have been less upset if i said i have to go to jail for 30 years you know like <laughs> what do you mean a musician like what are you talking about you can, no you can't like this is all an italian you yeah, right. a bunch of swear words you know like, <laughs> yeah, yeah um you know so I, I i felt bad but i just you know i always tell the kids that i work it's like if music for me it wasn't something that i i wanted to do it was it was kind of like breathing yeah. Like you don't mm -hmm. really want to breathe. You, you just know that if you don't breathe, you die. Yeah, yeah. You don't realize how important breathing is until you can't breathe. <laughs> yeah, and that's for true. Me, right? And for me, making music, that's what it was like. If I can't make music, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to do anything else. Luckily, Arnold, I, sorry to interrupt, though. I was reading that you actually wanted to be an athlete. At some point, is well, that true? Well, that prior to well, like funny, when I, shift. yes, when I was in high school, I was recruited by Cornell University. Um, so I was out like a tentative scholarship, but um, I was an offensive end, and uh, you know, I I I, I sort of uh, physically faster than all the other kids. So like in grade eleven, grade twelve in Canada. I'm six, three and a half, 220 pounds. I was wow. just killing. So, right. you know, and I'd won, you know, athlete of the year. And I won my junior letter my first year, my senior letter my second year. Because sports to me was, um, you know, I, it was just a way to, to, I think a lot of it. And, and through all this time, I was playing the piano because my dad mm -hmm. had bought himself a piano in 1965. He bought himself a piano um, just because he always wanted one. And he was, like I said, just unbelievable poor growing up, as one can imagine, in a, you know, World War II, right in the heart of it. So he said, uh, this is a story that we, my brother and sister have 
since then many times that he bought himself a piano so that he could play music because he always won on one as a kid. So I hear him, you know, I hear him after dinner and he'd be sitting there and he'd be, his favorite song was, you know, he had two, he had, you are my sunshine, my only son. And, he, and he'd play this with two fingers. And you'd think with playing two fingers, you'd at least get 50% of the note right. <laughs> Notes are all wrong, you know, but he's just making a racket. And I'm thinking, all right, that's, and, and, and he still love that song by, um, I want to say Roger Miller, you know, the trailer for uh, Sailor and, Rent. Yeah. Sailor Rent, right. Ruin Roger Miller, yeah. 50, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Roger Miller, yeah. And King he, of the so road. he used to try to, that's exactly right. Yeah. So yeah. he loved that song, um, which was funny for an old Italian guy, but that's what he loved, right? So sure, yeah, um, yeah. he'd play a bunch of Italian tarantellas, but none of the song sounded like what he was singing. But I just figured, oh, this is what it is. In 1970, uh, he, he died. And so uh, the piano was just there. So I was 14 at the time. I come home from school. And um, while my mom would make dinner, I'd go play the piano. And it wasn't, I honestly didn't know that I knew what I was doing until my sister, who came down to call me, say, hey, supper's ready. It's like she said, Arnold, how how are you playing that? And I'd say, I don't know, I'm just playing. It's like, like, how did you learn that? I said, Well, it's easy, just play the music you hear in your head. Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't hear music in my head. I said, yeah, <laughs> everybody I said, everybody hears music in their head. I, so I remember playing like early Chicago songs like Color My World. I remember wow. playing early Elton John and stuff like this and those are you know there weren't many um keyboards in rock that was you know like deep purple and organ player but at any rate i was playing pianos what i loved and then of course when i heard emerson lake and palmer for the first time which is a progressive band i really fell in love with the piano so i mm -hmm. teach myself more but it wasn't my sister said no no that you're you're being weird because i don't hear that you must you must have that kind of a gift. Uh, I, and, I, and, I, and I'll tell you why I thought that was crazy. In grade six in Canada at the time, to take a, what they call a musical aptitude test to go to right. your high. Because we from elementary school, kindergarten to grade six. Grade six, you went to a different, it's called junior high, I don't know what it's called now. And junior high was grade seven, eight, nine. Yeah. And then high yeah. school was 10, 11, 12, and 13 in those yeah. days. In Ontario, yeah. So to get in, so at the end of grade six, they took us to the junior high school that we were going to attend, and they give you a, a musical aptitude. Well, it's not just musical aptitude, they give you an aptitude test to find out what they're going to, how they're going to screen you. Mm -hmm. So I pulled out in my sheet of paper, oh, again, I'm going to take music. I'm going to learn this. And so anyway, I, I got I got the sheet back and it said, "No, you have no musical aptitude." <laughs> and so they what? said, "We're putting you in wood shop." <laughs> said, that, that sounds like my that sounds like they're, bigger it's laugh a... than you do because if you if you saw me handle a hammer up to ten years ago, you'd go, "Dude, this guy should not be anywhere near a fucking saw." <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, so I, I thought, well, they must know, like they must know what they're talking about. Maybe uh, when I teach myself the piano, I, I just figured, okay, I, I I sucked, right? But so I I never took serious. So sports was my way of mm. socializing. So and everything I did. Um, un unfortunately enough, because I lost a lot of friends this way, including being kicked out of my own band, uh, is I either go like full speed or I'm not doing it. Right. I can't tell you how many bands I started and got kicked out of my band. I remember Sheriff was the same way because I wanted to go faster, higher, better. Let's change our sound. Nope, 
they were stuck doing this. I said, like, there's there's more than just like four chords. Damn it! Come on, like, mm. you know what I mean? Like, how many can you shove a sausage down your trousers and go up on stage and go, yay! <laughs> <laughs> I still do that. Yeah, I still do that. Yeah, but the thing is, it's it's just music should be something rock and roll in those days for me. Whenever when you were a kid, did you ever go to a circus and see a high wire act? Sure, mm -hmm. of course. Well, what makes a high wire act exciting? is that it's like 100, 200 feet in the air and there's a guy or a girl up there and she's gonna walk by this thing and it's it's unbelievable because she had some great skill and it's scary as fuck. Yeah. But so that's what rock and roll used to be like. And then mm -hmm. for a period, it's like they took that high wire act and put it off the ground. <laughs> Now it's not exciting. It's like, right. all right, so if you know what, you break an ankle, you break your heel, like, <laughs> like, it got too safe. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and that's why ultimately production for me was a lot of fun because they got to be in everybody else's band and got to push boundaries in other areas where when you're in one band, unless you're like-minded, which is difficult because yeah, we all know, like in marriages and in families, there's band politics. Yeah, and to me, truly, sometimes a benevolent dictatorship works better. Mm, it sure. just it just does, you know, because yeah. uh, one could argue that the Beatles. I mean, if you if you look at that, and and for me, they're the, you know. The yeah, architect, it's the holy yeah. grail of, yeah, yeah, they are just the 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 greatest period. Yeah. Um, the interesting part of that band is, people thought the third most talented guy, who was George Harrison, he would have been a lead singer, lead guitar, lead songwriter, lead everything in any other band, but in the Beatles, he had Lennon and McCartney. I mean, yeah. <laughs> how? Like how crazy is that? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. so mm -hmm. like it's insane. And that band, all they had to do was literally tolerate each other <laughs> for a, another five years. Make who you know? Not that they haven't made gazillion already, right? But just getting in a a plane was too much. Yeah, they didn't yeah. do it. And I know yeah. bands today. They're, they've regrouped because they're men now. Right. When they're young, yeah. full of egos and pissing bigger and saying, well, I want to write this and you want to write that. It's like, well, okay, well, so we're all going to write and what? We're going to have two good songs and what? The rest are going to be shit? Is that how? Like, shouldn't, shouldn't it just be like boxing? I use left standing. That's who wins. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. And, right. And to me, that's how music should be. Like every idea should be every idea, but after you've considered it, it's like okay, it, is it is it resonating? Is it does it make you feel anything? If not, yeah. let's go on the next one. Mm -hmm. Right, right, and that's when bands get tricky. So I've been kicked out of my own band because I'm that guy that says you can do better. Right, yeah, but you know there I saw five people back there. And they were singing it. Well, <laughs> your parents don't count. <laughs> you know, it's it's just it's just crazy. So for me, that's the beauty of um, and of course I got into production um in, in a way uh, that's why when people say, Well, how this whole year with COVID been? And I said, Well, it's kind of like my whole life because I've always done things my own way anyway. I, I never did bands that got signed. I mean, I, I like obviously King's X was already signed to Atlantic when they called me. Uh, like Jeff Healy was already signed to, like I've done bands where signed and they called me to just come in 
and basically get us through this process. But usually I was the one that basically found the diamond in the rough way before they could hear it, spent a year of my own time and money developing them Hmm. and uh, got them a record deal. And so, and I'm happy to say that with every band that I've developed, even though we've had some rocky times, um, you know, it's funny. uh, I remember being invited to uh, at a wedding for one of the guys in Simple Plan and um, I used to tease him. I used to call him, you know, Blink 183. You know, because <laughs> like, it's, it's like, I, it's like God, you, you have to try to figure out who you are. Like, right. And so we used to fight about, and they were so young, they, they, they quite didn't get that whole thumbprint thing, but they mm. worked their ass off and they're just tremendous kids, right? Yeah. I mean, they're men now, but in those days, mm-hmm. they were just tremendous. They worked their ass off. We went through a rough patch, but it wasn't until they went out into the world, grew up, made a couple of records, and then thought, oh, okay, nah, now I understand this. And so, and it's funny, I'm happy to say that I'm still friends with all those guys. I, I'm invited to everybody's wedding, and they call me when they have a kid. Um, they understand more now because... Like I said earlier, I'm going on 10 or not doing this. Right. And so when I, I, fans would approach me and say, we want to make a record. I said, okay, you need to go home and think about this because I've made people cry. I'm not <laughs> wanting to, they just do. It's like, like we can't, we can't just be another band. It can't just be another song. Mm. We need to push whatever you've got mm. i'm going to get out of you one way or the other yeah. and it's not going to be fun you know but after you hold the stanley cup you don't mm. remember how shitty training camp was right right you know, <laughs> right apology. yeah you know, you know what I mean? like you just went through two and a half months of playoffs beating the shit out of each other every <clears> other <throat> night it's like that's why you're playing a broken leg is to lift this thing and now you're yeah. world champions yeah and music same way if i'm making a record if i'm going to dedicate six eight nine months of my time because i was never those guys that would do a project every six weeks i was I'd, I'd have worked for years but i'd say i'll start you when i finish this one and missed right. a lot of great opportunities because i say i'm too busy with this one and mm-hmm. um, I, I, you know, I, I always kid with my wife. If I would have done that record and this record, it's uh-huh. like, yeah, but then you wouldn't be who you are. And I say, yeah, right. yeah. So, you know, but hey, I'm so like, curious. To me, like to me, sorry, sorry. I was gonna say I wanted to take you back to Sheriff because that's a big geek sure. album for me. And, you know, every, <laughs> almost every song on that, I mean, every, the whole record, you can just listen to from front to back and every song is great. They're all different. And awesome. they're so melodic. And of course, Freddie has got such a melodic voice. Did you have those songs ahead? Of, and you're, you're the, the principal writer on all that stuff. Um, so yeah. did you have all those songs ahead of time or did you yeah. write them? Because obviously you wrote them for his range and his voice because they're so you know, all over the place in the melody. Well, tell, tell us about well, that. You well, know, you're exactly right. And you, you have a great ear because um, if if I have any kind of, uh, the attraction I have to music is that I like melodies that are dynamic in, in range. That's why a lot of the bands that I fell in love with um, that I ended up producing, even if it is a band like Our Lady Peace, they have to have a strong falsetto, you know, even yeah. if they can't sing it in, in, you know, real voice, they got to be able to hit some crazy note. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, but Freddie, he, you know, I want to, on one hand, I want to take credit for writing the song because I did, <laughs> you know, right. Uh, there were two songs on that record. I remember that, uh, I can't. I can't remember the the, the title. Crazy without you. Uh, Crazy without you. You wrote with yeah, Steve Martin. That, that, 
That's right. There, and there was another one too. And she kept me coming. Yes, right? That, that, that one. Yes, that right. one. So there were two songs that we uh, did together. And then the other ones I wrote. And the way it would happen is I say, guys, I, I have a song. And it goes like this. And then I teach everybody their parts. And they would, you know, uh, I guess interpret it and give it back to me. But basically, that whole, and of course, Freddie uh, could sing everything I brought to him because that was the, uh, a beautiful thing for me. It was like literally getting the keys to a Ferrari. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, the 300 in this thing. It's like, awesome. it's like, so I can right here, I can take the melody down there. So it was, it was amazing for that. And so, but yeah, uh, there's a lot of this. Uh, misinformation out there because um, I, I I don't do a lot of social media. Mm. In fact, you're it. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is it. We appreciate it. Yeah, I'm finally I'm I'm in the nineties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, and, and people they talk. So I don't want to take anything away from anybody. They they were my friends. They worked their ass off, and Freddie sang like a bird. And but those melodies, what you're hearing is that's right out of my head. Right. Mm -hmm. You know that. But he sang it, so mm -hmm. you know. Um, but 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 that's just you know anybody who writes songs, you know what it's like. You it's not it's not just about being close. It's like you know if. If I hear, it's like, yeah. Even if we get out of rock and roll, say Beethoven, sure. Like when he goes da 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 da, <laughs> comes down and sits to the orchestra. Okay, I want to go ba da, da the Beethoven step, and they go da da da. da. It's like no no no, I I want the other <laughs> interval. Yeah, but that's close. Yeah, <laughs> no, but that's not what I want. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So who's the asshole? Like, yeah. like, if that's what he hears, and obviously yeah. 300 years later, I think Beethoven knew what he was doing. He yeah. he could have he could have opted for any interval. Yeah, any note would have worked just fine. Right. You know, but that's the one that that was the money became it. You know, to yeah. use our islands for, and so I was a I was an asshole like that. You know, it's like <laughs> and I don't mind. I mindset. It. I was a dick because you know it has to be like this. Right. And that's why I ended up getting kicked out of my own hands. Yeah. Did yeah, other people bring songs? songs? Like, did other people bring songs to the project? Or? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, the producer would would pick. You know, like like when I when I work with bands, I'll say, "Bring me all the ideas you have. I don't want to know who wrote what." Mm. And whatever idea, we're going to put them in the middle of the floor and I'm going to punch them up. I don't care if the drummer wrote it or the bass player, everybody bring in your ideas. But mm. if they happen to be long one guy, I don't care. It's like, right. I, I just want the idea. And um, when before Sheriff split up, there was a moment where we were trying to keep things together. And that was one of the things that. Uh, the band would argue about because I'd written the whole first record more or less and they said well if we look for a record deal we all have to write mm -hmm. it's like okay well everybody should bring in two songs we started like that mm -hmm. well that didn't go well because a couple of guys couldn't write at all right Right. and, and so mm -hmm. uh, I said well you know what let's just we had another meeting, so let's just bring in whatever songs, bring in as many songs as you want. Right. So, I, you know, I would, the next time we got together, I'd bring in eight, nine, ten songs. Right. And then did a couple, I'd bring in a couple, you know. But the songs were so different now hmm. because it's like, oh, I didn't know that, it's like, I, I don't want, I, I really don't want to do that style anymore. Right, right. You know, it, it was, it was not unlike, you know, you imagine you have a friend in high school that 
you see in a hallway. And by the time you get to grade twelve, you, you for like you, you go for lunch, you order a hamburger, and he's horrified because you thought, "Oh my God, I thought you were a vegetarian." So, <laughs> no, no, it's, no, it's it's like somehow we because we made that record in 1981, released in 82, but I always tell people the band was brain dead around 84, but we didn't pull the plug till about 85, uh, right? Yeah. So, because we had debts to pay off and stuff, we, mm. like we were still, and they were my friends, and mm. we ended off in good terms until the song went to number one again, Mm. without anybody's knowing but right i didn't do anything to get to go number one all no. i did was like the song yeah 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 but that's when all the lawsuits start of course like, yeah. and you know i remember my lawyer telling me yeah you're not successful you have your first copyright lawsuit it's like yeah well this kind of sucks it's like yeah. well it, it is what it is it's you know it's kind of like having a mortgage you know, you want yeah. to be in this business, get you it, you know? Yeah. So, mm. it's just, Were they lawsuits I, I, for, the, uh, for the publishing or for actual writer's credit on those songs? Well, I, I, I was fought on everything, which was funny uh -huh. because I just collected royalties for seven years and nobody batted an eyelash. Why all of a sudden right. is there uh -huh. an issue? So it's always that way though. As soon as, it, as soon as something starts to make money, that's, that's when everybody starts, starts coming out of the woodwork. That's the way it works. Yeah. Do That's you think the, the problem? Yeah. Do you think the fact that you guys were still so young that had a big part to do with that as well? No, you know, maybe I, I don't know. It's it, it's so tough, and I and I see it replaying itself all the time with the artists I work with. Because of course, yeah, yeah. Most mm -hmm. artists, you know, I always tell the kids I work with, it's like, hey, this song you can leave it the way it is. Or we can do this and I'll play right. something. Mm -hmm. You know, and it takes a lot of balls on their part to go, yeah, you know what? That that's a good fucking part. Like right. that's a part. You know, right, and right. Because they but they're but they're being smart. I always tell people it didn't hurt Ringo that he didn't mm. write songs. No, 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 no. Yeah. He's still a legend. No, yeah, he's still a legend. Don Bonham's still a legend. You know, it mm. it did hurt Stuart Copeland's career that Sting wrote Every Breath You Take. No, not Sting, at all. Yeah. You, like, you know what I mean? It, like, yeah. it still yeah. made you one of the world's most famous drummers. And I <laughs> love Stuart Copeland's playing. So, yeah. But he's different than a guy like Bonham. But mm. for their bands, and I, so I tell young kids, you paid record royalties to compensate you for the session or you get paid a fee like i can't tell you how many times making records the kids in the band something might be over their head because they're just too you know it's like a field goal here it's the super bowl it's on the 47 it should be able to make this but it's kind of far but you got to kick it otherwise we lose hmm. i mean it's, it's, it's like making a putt at the Masters from 20 feet out. A right. pro should be able to make that. Me, mm -hmm. I don't get anywhere near close to that. But in <laughs> music, like, that's why I can make house. I can make that field goal. I can make it from the 60. I can make that 60-foot <laughs> putt. I'll drain it. Because there's nothing Laces in this out. business. Laces out, yeah. Laces out. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like there's not. I don't have many gifts. It mm. certainly isn't the way I. Look, let's put it that way. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, like, do you think? Do you I think hypothetically, no hypothetically speaking, that if you, as a band, would have had the success the first time around that that song had in the in the late eighties, do you think Sheriff would have? existed longer than they did or would was the writing already on or the would that just have pulled it apart quicker <laughs> yeah. uh, well, no i i think we would have lasted much longer because we actually did keep playing even without label because we tried right, right. just that music had it's hard to explain fellas now looking back that era is an object it's it the songs coming out of that era were awesome yeah mm -hmm. absolutely but in in its time, 
1983, people wanted to hear Tears for Fears, Flock of Seagulls, U2, The Alarm, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. The Cult. Mm -hmm. They don't, you know, still bands doing, you know, what I used to call hair rock. You know what I mean? Like it was, but you want to do have already have established yourself, Metallica or Bon Jovi or, you know, like, like, like when I talk to Bill, Bon Jovi can literally do whatever he wants and he's going to pick in every does. Yeah. But you know what? They still want to hear, you know, like. Living on a prayer or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Name a hundred of his. <laughs> yeah, songs, exactly. All of which were co-written. Mm. He's a smart guy. You know what I mean? John's not a dummy. No. He knows his gift. His he looks amazing. Has a great voice. He's not the greatest songwriter, but you know, I put him in a room with somebody like, uh, you know, the, Desmond Child. He's like. Desmond Child, Jim Valance, whatever. Yeah. All of a sudden, you've got some great songs. Mm, yeah. And if you don't have something to sing, like Celine, where is Celine Dion in this world without the theme from Titanic? Yeah. You know, where's, you know, like, where's Elvis without like, Hound Dog and like Frank Sinatra without My Way? Like, yeah. You you need the the song is blood of yeah. this industry. It mm. is what it is. And I just wish musicians could see the big picture. And what I love about the street today, guys, is unlike when Sheriff was around, we, we couldn't own anything. I mean, these right. idiots with bad suits were calling all shots. They owned our name. They owned our likeness, our merch. They, they, literally, if we sold a T-shirt, they made money. Like, right. we were making anything. Nothing. Wow. Publishing yeah. nothing. At least today, mm. if you've got an idea, I can work with the band this afternoon, and by Friday, it could be reaching the world. Yeah, you just yeah. believe in that song. Yeah. Now, more yeah. more than ever, the song has to resonate. It does. But, yeah. And and that's what's so awesome when I'm with you is that not only did it connect with you, um, but it. Uh, I still get fan mail, and uh, and there's another song I have with uh, when I when I was with Frozen Ghost. Some of the most incredible fan mail. One brought me to tears, and I it's I, I want to share it with. You. It's a little bit sad, but um, it's the most incredible story. It was uh, and it was written by it was a real note. A guy wrote me a letter saying. I could um, give find music for a song called Dream Come True because his mother used to sing it. For his earliest recollections were him playing in the kitchen and his mother would sing it to the record all day long, all day long. And she had just passed away oh. and they wanted to put 45 and this music in her coffin. Mm. Wow. Because wow. that was her all-time favorite song, and wow. they played the song at the funeral. It's oh like, th like that's the power. That's when you know a song resonates. Absolutely. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Like it, it meant something, and and to me, you know, if I make ten dollars today, I'll spend it. I'll make another ten dollars tomorrow. Yeah. But what you, what you're not guaranteed is that is that moment where you move somebody. And yeah. the beautiful thing with with writing a song or uh, or a great performance, when you guys play or you're in the studio and you're playing your instrument and people, you know, thousands of miles away are hearing it going, fuck, I love these guys. Yeah. Like, I just love what they do. Yeah. You can't understand that enough. And so, I mean, to, to answer your question... Come on, that's a great melody. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now oh, we're gonna God. get <laughs> now we're gonna get shut down for licensing on that. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Just tell yeah. him the guy said it was fine. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Arnold's right there. He's right yeah. there. Uh -oh. yeah, 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 yeah. I would. 
I would love to hear some, not to cut you off, I would love to hear some stories about King's X and how that all transpired. Yeah. Oh, how that what record did you do again, Arnold, for them? I, I, ear candy. I did one called oh, ear, candy. ear Candy. Oh, I love that record. They, they, wanted, so they wanted to go for something different. And look, I loved the King's X. And I'm, you know, pals Amazing. with yeah. Doug today. Um, what I, I would say the most pure voice all of music has got to be Doug. He's just insane. Like, yeah. I mean, now, by the time I got to them, they had just done a record with him. And um, they they wanted to try something different. They were having a lot of infighting with the management. And I don't want to speak out of school too much because, you know, uh, the way I, in studios, things happen. It's not meant for outside people. It's meant for the, those of us that are in the, the war room kind of thing. But right. if it's, I don't mind sharing some amazing stories. Like I remember with, unfortunately, they were a little bit gun shy. So on that record, I wasn't able to do a lot of what I wanted to do because they were so, um, I'll say nervous about people fucking them over. Mm. Um, and by people, I mean their manager, you know, sure. who was also their producer in the beginning. Right. Sam Taylor. So yeah. it's just a very bad. So uh, I remember Ty coming in saying, you know, I want my, give me five tracks on the console. And we're working in Globe, just outside of Los Angeles. And um, I'll let you change the, like, I want to EQ my own sound. And, and Bug would say, I want this. And Jerry would say this. Like, well, guys, this is, we're going to make a record. Like, like, like there's got to be one chef. Bring all the ingredients in. Let me cook it up. If you don't like the way it tastes, fire my ass. But this is, mm, right. I can't make a record like this. Right. Mm. So we found some middle ground. Mm. But I remember doing vocals. And and I've been used to doing vocals that would take like weeks. And we were running out of time. Because the let's just say they were notorious for working on their own schedules. Let's just say mm. that. Um, sure. <laughs> and I was one of those. And I was one of those guys that was a ten o'clock call, like I'm there at nine thirty. You know, it's like right. I'm looking at my watch a quarter to ten. If I don't see people in the room, I start getting a little bit nutty. Yeah. You know? Again, mm. I'm on ten usually. Um, but at any rate, so we're running out of time, and I, I said, I said to Doug, Doug, we got to get these songs sung. Uh, are you going to be okay? Do, do I need to book another week in here? Oh, no, we'll be fine. It's like, you sure? It's like, oh, yeah, we're going to be good. It's like, oh, all right. So put up the first song, and we we had uh, one 24-inch tape, and we had a couple of ADAP machines slipped. So, you know, I had a couple of assistants, and I said, okay, guys, are we uh, – and I have a hat. I record everything when we're starting because – even if he's just warming up because in those days um, – you know, you don't know if you're going to get it again. And um, unlike today where I can literally hundreds of bonus tracks on a drive, in those days, after you slave the tape and you leave one uh, track for hi-hat, you got basically 22 tracks on tape, you know, whatever's going down on ADAT. And that was all 16-bit and 12-bit, sounded like two. So we said, I'm putting the vocal on there. So... We're basically, everybody said, yeah, good to go. I did, did a mic check. Uh, and I, I always hate burning up the singers. So I would do my regular checks with one of the assistants. And when Doug goes in there, you know, he sparks up a joint and um, shuts off the light. And um, I, you know, I hit top five, he says, Doug, you ready to go? He goes, yeah. And and he goes, yeah, I'm going to take down this mic. I said, what, what do you mean? I'm just going to, so he. He takes it, he sits down and he's leaning against the back wall in the vocal booth and puts the mic down. I said, Are you gonna sing sitting down? He goes, Yeah, yeah. He goes, I, you sure? He goes, Yeah, I got this. Uh, okay. It's like, so, you know, I'm not thinking I'm gonna get anything, but I, I hit the record button. The song starts. All of a sudden, this like magical 
home comes out. Mm-hmm. And I go all the way through to the end, the assistant, do you want me to no no leave it, leave it, leave it. And like and he's he's blowing like he's got <laughs> and he, doesn't, he doesn't make the line because he's blowing a reefer with the like, wow. like, but I said, leave it, leave it, right? Uh. He's saying the entire record in two days. Wow. The, the entire album. Like, like, it was impossible. It's like, how, how is this possible? Like, I've worked with singers where it takes them 10 days to do one song. Yeah. This guy yeah. sang the entire album in two days. It's, wow. it's just like he sings and Velvet comes out. Yeah, yeah, that's the best. That's the best word like, for it, for sure. Yeah, he's just, uh, and he was a sweetheart. And of course, this was before. You just got every you know, young uh, singer hooked on weed now. So, <laughs> <laughs> gateway now, drug. For me, this was weird, <laughs> fellas. For me, this was weird because I, I never drank. I, I, I never smoked. I didn't. Um, um, I always thought my vice is ice cream, and I'm trying to cut that out. But uh, <laughs> I, I, it was weird because. I thought, how is he going to be able to to sing sitting down, first of all? Yeah. How is he going to give me any air, any smoking? And then, um, after every song, I usually call the singer in and said, you know, and I'll record like four or five passes so that we have something to listen to. I'll say, just come on in. He turns on the light, opens the vocal booth, and it was like... Uh, <laughs> Cheech and Chong? A queen concert. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, there's smoke. Like, like, out of the light. Maybe he does like that just so he can make a it's big like, entrance. Oh! And he comes, Doug. He's like, and he comes in, he's like, his eyes are like this. Like, that time? I, said, I said, Doug, you are God. Like, and I'm just rip, 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 ripping through the, like, they're, they're like, they're all, I said, they're all keepers, except where you're coughing smoke out of your face and mm. he goes well that's good goes, no it's it's amazing it's like it's unheard of <laughs> that's how gifted he was you know what i mean yeah. um the unfortunate part is during that time there was a lot of, um like i was going through um an awareness let's just say he you know he he wasn't quite who he is today let's put it that way uh in those days, it was tough. He, to be, first of all, he was a black singer playing, I'm just using Seinfeld quotes, white rock music. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. So he had a lot of people, like radio stations that in the South that wouldn't play him. But That's so crazy. I'm telling you, so... when I got the call to do those guys, uh, like their manager said, okay, I'll send the papers over. It's like, I don't care. Don't send papers. I I want to I want to do this record, and I said, well, there's also Gary Harrison's up for the gig. I was like, I'll do it for free. And wow. my my brother goes, Arn, that's a bad negotiating tactic. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like I don't care. Like, I was such a fan after hearing, like, Under Asylum Planet. Like, when I heard yeah. that record, that was the beginning of what they call grunge music. Yeah. And the funny yeah. thing is, and I don't know, I don't know if you know this, but the guys, like we we're making a record, they'd get calls from like Pearl Jams, uh, the the Nirvanas and uh, the Allison Gaines, all these guys would show up at the studio, they'd call up because they all felt like they were opening up for all these bands because in the early days they would go up to Seattle or the Northwest. Bands like Pearl Jam and Sunguard would say, "Hey, if we roadie for you, can we open up for you." So they would say, mm. "Sure." So they'd open up for them, and that's what I mean. You hear Allison Chains? Come on, you can't tell me they didn't get their harmonies from King's X. Yeah, right. Mm. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. Like just really. listen to their first record. Just listen to it and yeah, go. Sure. And Doug and those guys—they were tuning down to a C. Yeah, crazy. Like, without, without the use of a baritone guitar. I mean, it was insane. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah. and, and Ty would play 
about how are we going to keep this guitar in tune? In my head, I'm going, <laughs> like, you know, he would literally, he sat down because he had a broken leg at the time. Again, the shit that went on during that record. But mm -hmm. he took the feather pick. Like, when you hear a song, you think, oh, he's just sending it. But literally, he's barely moving his, his plectrum, his pick. Mm -hmm. He's just, and he's just always playing it. I'm thinking, how the hell do you keep that in tune? But yeah. they were they were in what they did. Nobody did it better. And I'm sorry you you like those guys because to me, I don't think they get enough credit. They um, don't. I mean, they're they're they one of the special bands of our time. Just absolutely. The OG. They are. They are. Absolutely, you're exactly right. I mean, I, I every time I see them, I, it's like. I, I don't know how he hadn't um, turned into an asshole because he doesn't get enough. Like, if I was him and just discovered uh, gold and someone else took, you know, credit for it, I think I'd lose my fucking mind. But yeah. he, like, he's still the same sweet guy, you know? And um, he, he just doesn't get enough credit for it. And the songs, yeah. now the songs we did on that record, they were the label uh they really wanted to go in a different direction they said look we, we get that they can do this this and the other the reason why they went to me they said is because they want to get some other sensibilities like they wanted to get mm. out out of the box they were in they just did three or four wrecks that more have the same kind of coloring mm -hmm. and they said that we, we just need something a little different and made it made it uh clear from the beginning they and it was quite confrontational they didn't want me to sing any parts like like mm. don't tell us to play mm. um would just well how do i ask you to play something if i don't show you i want you to he goes well you're gonna have to figure that out so <laughs> wow. you know it, 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 they were just gun shy. Now, towards the end, when I earned the trust, it was a little bit different because they realized, "Hey, man, I like, I, I'm just here because I love you." Guys. I mean, obviously, I ended up getting paid, and you know, mm. it's, but I would have done that record for nothing. Like that's how, how long. Them. How long was that whole episode like from the start to the finish? That it was nice. Record? Yeah, 96, 95. Oh, gosh. Someone. Gosh. That, you know what? That's a good question. It's all, that, that period of my life is such a blur because I literally I, I just didn't sleep. I just worked seven days a week. Every day. I just remember, honest to God, I remember flying to Houston for the audition and then flew back hearing that I did the gig. And then flew right back down to do pre-production, and I, I just don't remember what I remember what year it was. I, I mean, at least find out. May May ninety six. So you probably nine in ninety five. Oh. You were working on it then. Uh yeah yeah. So I would say because I remember being in Glendale in uh, uh, August September and a bit of October. So I want to say we had that studio locked out. Anywhere between eight and ten weeks in Glendale. I don't think the studio is there anymore. Uh, it might be a dentist office now, or like every other studio. I'm not sure, but um, but uh, the, the interesting part was at night. It was uh, two studios under one roof, so we'd be making a racket during the day, and at night um, they had a room called the back room, uh, a big hip hop studio at the end of the hall but every once in a while they'd stay late i'd be there at 10 in the morning and they're still working on it so i remember one day funny story i went down i had to go back there i said because i was feeling a rumble in my room i, I gotta record like i gotta record today and i'm hearing literally out of my microphones on the drums i'm hearing you know the eight yeah, right. <laughs> pummeling through the to the concrete so i went back i said oh this is gonna be bad like they, they've been there all night 
they're going to tell me to fuck myself, you know. Or, <laughs> I said, I, so I show up and <laughs> just two big guys show up before I walk in. It's, it's like, happy. It's like, yeah, I'm just I'm in the front studio. Um, my name's, you know, Arnold Lanny. Uh, is, is the producer in at all? Can I talk to him at all? Just sit here. It's like, right, right. So, and <laughs> man, the smell of coming out of that place. Wow, that was insane. Yeah. So anyway, the most sweet guy comes out. He, uh, he's like an older guy. And, uh, he says, yes. It's like, um, I'm all, and before I get the words out, he goes, oh, my God, it's shit. Should be finished. Sorry. Like you're, you're hearing you're hearing the bass, right? And I, I said, yeah. He goes, oh, fuck, man, I'm so sorry. Are you about to start? I said, yeah, but if, if you're finishing up something, feel free. So he goes, can I just have another five, ten minutes? I go, yeah, yeah, sure. So comes over to my session now. He, they finished because I can hear now. Um, he comes in and <laughs> he looks at our mic on all drums and he says, wow, you guys use mics. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah. yeah, that's, I said, that's why it was a problem with the, with the bass. Because why? Like, what are you guys using? Well, I mean. PC. Everything's DI'd. Like, yeah. yeah everything's like, in every, the box. Everything yeah. is DI'd. It's like if we're doing a vocal, of course, but everything's DI'd. And, I, and he said, So you're recording the whole tracks with mics? I said, Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought it was a trick question, you know? Like, <laughs> but, but the sweetest guy, he's like, like, if you come in again and we're going like, just come and tell me. And I'll <laughs> tell those guys to let you in. Like, don't, they're just trying to intimidate you. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Like, I said, I, I come respectful. And he goes, no, man, you're a good dude. And, and he would, and he said, do you mind if I just come in and check you guys out every once in a while? I looked at the band and they said, he's like, yeah. So he would come in because he was as curious about how we made records mm -hmm. as I was about how they made records. Because totally, yeah. they start at a completely different place than we do. You know, like yeah, 100%. we've already done two, three weeks of pre-production. You know, I got the band out there playing live, and they're starting with like a kick and snare. You know, yeah. and yeah. that's it. That's that's. It's like okay, well, hey, it doesn't matter how you get the finish line. It's no, that's for sure. There. Yeah, hundred percent. So, but uh, amazing. Yeah. So but, that being said, I mean, you you mentioned earlier that. You, I mean, and, and you can answer this or you can choose not to, but you had said that you had kind of missed the opportunity to do some albums along the way because of your other existing schedule. Is there a project or a band that you still to this day would, would love to work with or would, you know, would take a shot at, at a record with? Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you that this is a funny story. What is it? It, it's only funny now because of the way it's ended up. And then, of course, COVID happened. But about 20-something years ago, um, I got a call from a real young kid named Chad Kroger. Mm, and, sure. of course, this is before they did uh, you know, the You Remind Me or whatever it was called, that the big, the big song, right? The big right. record. Mm -hmm. I get a phone call. This is road manager. I want to say it was chief or something. Uh, he called yeah, me. Uh, yeah. Hey, yeah, say, I, I want to put you in touch with someone. So it's like, sure. So anyway, we get on the phone and we, we talk. And his recollection is different than mine. That's what's funny. The reason why we've had a chance to talk about it, long story short, he said, hey, we're, we're going to make, make a record. And his exact words were, it's going to be fucking great, and you need to be part of this. He goes, I love what you did with any any singing parts of the F11 record, and you know, he asked me about a bridge in that song. There, you wrote that fucking bridge, right? And it's like, and he was really forward, and I just loved his energy, right? And I said, uh, yeah, it's like, but but Chad, I, like, when are you starting? He goes Monday, and like it's Friday. <laughs> right? like it's literally, they're starting on Monday. It's like, like literally, like you couldn't give me more than three days. Am I your last choice? He goes no, like this because we booked a bunch of tours and we don't want to say no to the tours. 
So we got two weeks to make this record. Just drop whatever you're doing, come down, and make a record. Like, we'll, we'll record it in no time. And I said, man, like, I can't. Like, I'm literally I'm starting the Simple Plan record. Mm. So I said, I'm in pre-production right now. Like, I, like, I can't just leave one band to go do another. It just, even if they said yes, I feel bad, right? Like, right, that's right. who I am. And so he said, fuck, man. Like, like you know what? I'm going to call you again. And it's like, no, no. So it's like, no, no, I'm going to call you again. So anyway, he calls me again. And he says, okay, did you think about it? Did you come to your senses? He says, you're going to fucking regret this if you don't. And it's literally, like, I'm being horrible. But I said, I, I, honest to God, I want to. And I never met him before. He's so <laughs> frank. He's being so honest and frank, so giving of himself that I, I said, you know what? Um, like, I, I, I'm so I can't. He goes, well, you're going to fucking live to regret this. And, you know, and, and we say, we, 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 we say, like, actually, like, I just said, look, man, I wish you the best of luck. I, I really can't thank you enough for calling me and considering me. He goes, well, you know, you're, like, you're going to regret this. And, and then he laughed and I probably will. Anyway, um, months and months go by. And of course they explode, right? Like they just, they become the nickelback everybody knows they are. So this is eating away at me now for like five years go by, 10 years go by, 15 years go by. Last year, just before uh, COVID, maybe a year and a half ago, I said, this is fucking ridiculous. I got it. Like, that's the one record that haunts me to this day. Because I got such a good vibe off him. I, I knew he would have been well because he was so full of energy. Anyway, um, I got, you know, I called his manager. I said, look, I I, I just wanna, I don't want to be that guy and just call him. Can you ask him if it's okay if I, if I get a hold of him? I want to reach out to say hi and... So I give him my information, and of course, you know, two minutes go by, I get a text from him saying, yeah, man, call me anytime. So we we talk on the phone, and I said, to the, and, he, and he makes some kind of joke like, oh, now? Now you have to call me? Like, it's like, you're 20 years too late. It's like, it's like, you, it's like Chad, I, I didn't say no because I didn't want to. Anyway, he's such, he's such a great guy, but what happened was I said, look, I, I'm like, I wouldn't say I'm bored. I just want to do something that's fun. Like, like, I don't want to go make records in three days anymore. It's like, it's like, it's like nobody wants to make up a guitar. Anymore. Like everyone's, I mean, I get like budgets are, like, I, I get that. But I, I said, if you want to do anything different, let me know. So he ends up in a hold of me. I go to visit him. We, uh, first time I meet him in person, he couldn't have been more gracious. This is about a year ago. We start doing some writing sessions. We got like three or four songs in the can. And uh, there's talk of, you know, that, yeah, you know what? We're going to put this out as a record. And so, and through the whole thing, he's literally kidding me about what's different now. 20 years, like, why all of a sudden we're good enough? And, and, and and it was it's just funny because I said, Chad, I'm sitting in your like fifty thousand square house. I don't think it's uh I think you've done okay. <laughs> you, know, yeah, like, yeah, so yeah. you don't have to keep throwing this on my face again, right? <laughs> but, um so literally the week they shut down California last I wanna say it was the was the first or second week of March. The reason why I remember is I was up in Vancouver, up at his place in Abbotsford, and we were just working on tracks. I flew back home with the idea that I'd go back up there. And um, next thing you know, I, I had a stopover in Seattle. Uh, there was a, some kind of issue. Of course, in those days, if you, if you remember, that was the first hot spot the nursing homes. So right. I came home. I got really sick. I didn't if I had COVID or not, I just got really sick and like pneumonia, the whole deal. Oh, um, 
they so they shut down the airports and we haven't been able to be to get back since so mm. the ongoing joke is we got, I'm destined never to make a record with you. That's just the way wow. it is. Now we got this other fucking disease. Because this year, yeah, we were supposed to we we're supposed to put out a record, but of course nobody yeah. can tour. You know, uh, it just is what it is. But the only project, and I say no to a lot of people, but to this day, that's the one, the one guy that turned out to be. The sweetheart I always thought he was. That's wow. awesome. Yeah. Stuff in my ears. That are you getting as well, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a little noise there going on. Aliens. It happens. Someone's watching yeah. TV. That's very strange. Oh, it's gone. Oh, it's okay. Gone now, I guess. Well, yeah, well gremlin, Arnold, but... your stories yeah. are amazing. We appreciate. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is uh, this is only a, this is part one. We're gonna yeah. do part, part two. <laughs> For sure, part right? two starting. Wait, part two starting now. And so, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Look, I, feel free to like. I know you guys got shit to like. It was a pleasure talking with you guys. Like, I got so many fucking stories. Like, and if you haven't noticed, I could talk forever. So yeah, you, I, I you dig literally, it, if you ever somebody just drop out at the last second, yeah, just, just have it on. You jump on. Oh, yeah, shit. Like, why don't you I'm just fine. be the sixth? So, why don't you just be the sixth member of Tube Talk now? We'll just talk to other people. Call Chad up, and we'll get this story straightened out here. We'll uh, yeah, we'll get Chad up. in, and yeah. then we'll just we'll let you talk. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, on He's, that note, it has been a blast. He, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, guys. You've been uh, you you've you've been um, really really gracious and. Uh, Again, thank you again for doing that cover. Uh, oh, you did a great job, uh, and um, it's uh, to me again. It, it, it's extra special because the song means so much, and you did such a great job. And now that I've met you, uh, even though it is virtually, um, I just wish you guys all the best. Like you guys are. It, is it weird that we dedicate that? Is it weird that we dedicate that song to your wife as well? Is that is that? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, 40 years. That was what the younger guys is like, yeah, sure. <laughs> Actually, next on part two, I want to hear her side of the story now. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Get her, her side of the story. That'd be awesome. You got a couple of weeks to go find that cassette, too. Yeah, yeah you got a couple of weeks to go find the cassette. Yeah. Awesome. Amazing. awesome. Well, right, thanks fella. so much, Arnold. Thank you for your time, man. That was yeah, so great. Last. Like awesome. 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 You, be, you guys stay All right, safe, lads. okay? You too. Right, absolutely. You too. Thanks, right, everybody. Lads. Take care. Be good to each Take other. Take care, man. All right, guys. Be good to meet you, Arnold. Thanks again. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was awesome.